Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! Yo! Hello. We're going to start with weird things here in just a minute. Ooh. Excuse me. I am... I was telling the guys earlier, my allergies are still real bad. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, it's probably not the uh, the cedar. Like, from what I hear, you come to Austin, it's a paradise, and then you wait as a sinister allergy develops in your gut, and then five years in, you become sensitive to the cedar. You get the cedar fever, and then you're like, Judas, this is Judas territory, and you want to destroy it. Well, it might be cedar. It's been so nice. I wouldn't be surprised if... Uh, Brian, have you been listening to the Auntie Donna podcast? Not as much as I should. I'm so glad. I was just hungering. Uh, you ever you ever have that spot where your appetite for new podcasts outpaces people's releases of those podcasts? Sure. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, well, I, this, this is always a hard time because everybody's j probably this week just gearing back into regular schedule. Right. Yeah. Um, two things about the Auntie Donna podcast. Number one, there's a recurring bit where Sam... Their, uh, their one musician, of, one of their, their DJ. Mm, I think he might be the director, not the not, oh. not the not the DJ, but uh, he is now a recurring character, just as Judas, who literally is a one note character that loves silver, and they keep just putting <laughs> him in positions where he has to <laughs> figure out a way to shoehorn in the fact that he loves silver. Uh, but number two, if you ever want to feel that uh, uh, although Auntie Don is one of our favorite sketch comedy groups, they're very, very funny. They're great directing, great music, great original music, great performers live. That there's a skill that you have that Auntie Donna does not. This most recent episode, it becomes a bit that n nobody's going to end the show. Because <laughs> uh, they're normally very tight at about like 20 minutes of like funny stuff. Uh, they're not long haul truckers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they are they are sprinters, not marathon runners. <laughs> and uh, it is I, I feel like you will listen to it and be like, wow, that's a thing that I can do. I can talk for three hours <laughs> and have it be listenable. And it's funny because it's unlistenable, uh, but it's it's awesome. But I, I'm sure they would be the first to point out that that was sort of the point of the bit. Uh, but but still, uh they, oh, they, no, they're just angry at each other that it's still funny that they're not ending it. And, like, it is every instinct that they have that, like, timing, pacing matters. That's, like, a lot of what they do. That's what makes them special. And yet, for the bit, they keep, for whatever reason, <laughs> extending it or taking <laughs> any little hair to extend it further just so they can torture each other to the point where... Uh, I think multiple members leave at certain points, hoping that it would end when they leave, only for it to continue to stretch on for like 50 minutes. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Check it out. Check it out. All right. Anything else before, anything we, else? before we start? Ready, ready. ready, ready. Oh. Uh, no, let's let's do it. Okay. Well, then, well, Andrew, then, Andrew. You, <clears throat> oh, we're getting a little bit of a, a delay or a little bit of Test, test, test. Home. Hello, hello. Yo, 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 yo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Me, 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 me. Hey, hey. Okay, well, it seems like it's gone. Good right. episode. It's been weird. Putting, <laughs> putting right. the pairs in place. All oh, right. uh, uh, before well, we start, oh, there there okay, might be so. a important um, mortgage-related phone call that happens at some point, just FYI. Okay, so everyone pull up. Uh, okay, your so you're going to take it books. on the air. Yeah, yeah. take it that's, on the that's air. That's what I'm well, saying. Brian, Brian's going to get a reverse mortgage <laughs> on the air. That's right. That's right. All right, well then, uh, now, take it away, Andrew. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. What's going on? Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Brian Brushwood. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Gentlemen. Hello. Yo. Uh, Remember that social network, Yo? Wait, uh, yeah. what, was that a thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, remember yo? You had you were you were on yo, and all you could do was yo somebody else, and that's it. Yeah, you it, just hit a button, and it would go yo, 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 and you just keep hitting yo to the point where uh, they'd want to they'd want to kill you. <laughs> that's it, amazing. It, it, it evolved a little bit, but it was a very simplistic kind of like just automatic use of these messages. It had a pretty oh, no. fast early growth, I, and. <laughs> 
I just found out something very terrible about uh, Yo. Oh no, what? Y- yes, go for it. Yo is on Patreon now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wasn't Yahoo looking at buying Yo at one point? Wow. Oh. Yeah, I think that was that was in 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 the Marissa Meyer buying spree. That was like post Tumblr when she took over Yahoo. Oh. But that was certainly the uh the 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 app of the moment, the social network of the moment that everybody could uh could could overpay for. But yeah, that one that one came and went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was part of it was because you looked at it was right around the period where Snap was on its Snapchat was on its ascendancy. WhatsApp and uh, gosh, what else were you Line, know maybe or WeChat? Yeah, there was another, there's another another one I'm forgetting that's super big. Uh, but anyhow, like you know, they're they're these things like you know just getting giant, and people were like, well, we don't want to miss out on this. A lot of people were dismissive of Snapchat early on because well, we already have Facebook, then Snapchat grew, but never still has yet to develop a revenue model. Um, yeah. I don't know why I'm laughing at a company that's cratering in its value and lots of people who are may, you know, be losing jobs. Yeah, um, you should but, be you, and you should be afraid because that's in LA so they could actually punch you. <laughs> have you ever met a Snapchat employee? They're gonna just go by right, on their lime. Oh, weird flex, they're but okay. Go, they're gonna go. They're gonna fly by in the lime scooter, you know, and slap me in the back of the head. All right, there we go. The offer's out. If you are a, a Snapchat employee, Andrew will fight you in the street. You, you can no, tell. Uh, I will. Uh, and, and he means it because he's taken off his Snapchat sunglasses and put them in his pocket <laughs> so that he can get rough and tumble with you. <laughs> All right, let me be very clear. Um, Snapchat deserves a lot of credit <laughs> oh no now it's gonna be an hour <laughs> <laughs> um for its non-violent <laughs> approach towards resolving conflicts yes <laughs> and, all right there we go our episode title you wouldn't hit a man with spectacles <laughs> <laughs> um well, it's 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 a there's a there's a book called uh, How to Say No to a Billion Dollars, whatever was written by a guy who was like roommates or friends with Evan Spiegel. It's it's worth it's an interesting read. Um, and I stand by my you know, the, the problems I, I, I thought with that company early on, like I don't think they don't have their AdWords model. They're not going to be their their, av- their revenue model. And that's clear. But and I do really mean this. What they did with stories, which now is part of Instagram, what they did with that is cultural shifting. It yep. really it was a phenomenon happening around us, and I don't think the rest of larger media realizes the significance of what took place there. Agreed. Yeah, no, they 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 invented Facebook right up to the point of wall, uh, and then didn't take that next step. And then Instagram said, "Yoink! Thank you very much. We'll take that core idea and we'll develop all the things that are frustrating about uh, uh, about Snapchat to the well, point we- where like." Now it is just annoying to go to Snapchat. I, I, I try to repost the stuff that I do on Instagram, and it's like, why can't – I don't even know if you can do the things, but I like everything about Instagram stories, and I just stop using Snapchat. Yeah. Well, Obfuscation was a feature for now. them until it was a hindrance post-IPO, and then they tried to fix that, and it didn't really work. Yeah. Well, even – I don't know if you've seen this. Like, YouTube has stories now. So yeah. does the new yeah. version of Skype. Skype has stories for some reason. <laughs> And it's, 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 you know, it's one of those things where you go back at where did that become a big thing? And that was a snap and realizing that content, it was the first point that like, Hey, let's make content just for me and my friends. Not because I want to go big on YouTube or anything like this. I want to make a cool thing. That's going to have a lifespan of, you know, two dozen of my friends at most. And that was, my brain was too primitive to understand that. Because I'm like, I'm going to podcast for everybody. I'm going to do YouTube for everybody. I'm going to blog for everybody. But a lot of younger kids are like, nah, I just want to share it with my friends. Yeah, well, And more specifically, kind of... not with my parents. Like, uh, yeah. uh, whether or not specifically they were doing anything bad or not, uh, certainly, like, there is an audience that they don't want to have see that thing. And, uh, mm-hmm. and now in an age where... Uh, you know, uh, whether it's the embarrassment of being sucked into a divisive political debate or whatever, like now I'm like, oh, yeah, no, there is <laughs> there is a place for a social thing that's not forever and not for everyone. And you think part of it is like, you know, you go hang out at a, you know, go to a, go to a bar, hang out with some buddies, drink some beers, talk politics, sports, whatever. It's ephemeral. It's an mm-hmm. ephemeral yeah. thing. And and 
it doesn't have to be, oh, and we should record this and do a podcast. Like, God, no, no, we just want to be ourselves. And that's what Snap offered was let's just be ourselves here in this thing and not, not be criticized because of the. And, and, and uh, there could be said, like, there's an important role you know, introverts versus extroverts. Uh, introverts tend to take in a lot of stuff, and then when they do speak, they they know exactly what they plan to say because they've already written or whatever. But extroverts tend to figure it out uh, on on the fly. That's why they talk to other people because they're trying on stuff, and as they say it, say it, they're like, eh, "Is that right? Oh no, I think that is right." Or mm-hmm. that part that I should no, I should have said it this way. It's that refinement, and I think that that is especially uh, in an environment where increasingly you know uh, everything you say is set into stone I, as i once tweeted uh, twitter's what happened when uh, what is what happens when you want a chat room but you only have press releases and uh, yeah. like all of a sudden it's like wow i would love to be able to extrovert through ideas in a, in a non-public way yeah now that being said brian you uh, i remember at one i'm trying to explain like the why anybody in their right mind would want to do snapchat Right. Like, I had, is there a point where you ever got into uh, uh, any stories like ask sort of media? Uh, n- not on Patreon. Snapchat, but but I did on um, uh, I, I did try it intentionally with Instagram. It didn't take there. But then Patreon was it, man. T- Patreon lenses all of a sudden when I was like uh, the idea of doing something performing for uh, what might be an empty room is is so at odds with what I've spent the last 25 years training my brain to do that that I never quite landed but the idea especially quite brilliantly Patreon puts that big old dollar value of who has seen your stuff hey this many people pledging this many dollars just watched your little 30 second rant that all of a sudden I was like I will perform all day for my real bosses who are paying me real money no it's a good point like I I have that in my head, like, uh, what am I creating, though? Is this for my friends? Screw them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want like, the world to see my brilliance. Yeah, but you already uh, have uh, group uh, Bryce, chat. Yeah, what, what, what is your experience with the, with the stories media format? Uh, I tried using Snapchat, the Snapchat stories, for a long time, and I, my, my frustration with that was that um, I, didn't, I didn't like using Snapchat uh, outside of having a story, right? I was not, I, I didn't do any group chats through it. Uh, I wasn't using it for one-on-one communication. And so everything else around Snapchat was just annoying enough that I said, well, Instagram already has stories, so I'll just do that. And so even now, I don't use Instagram stories a lot. I'll, I'll do them if, if there's something I find, but, um, but I also don't use Instagram as much uh, uh, lately either. Uh, but I, I do prefer Instagram stories. I mean, they're longer... And they, they they actually save stuff. You can actually make like a, a collection of stories. So if like, okay, here here is something I was doing all day for a day, I can permanently keep that as like a separate story on my thing. Like it's it's very yeah. feature rich in a way that like I only use it very occasionally, but when I do, it's nice to have kind of all of those options. To have that yeah, that element. I, I will say it it's it's pretty rad. I I found myself using it more and more uh and it's one of my resolutions for this year is to just be because like for for to, to your point brian i do think that there is room for both i don't know exactly where i i've i've put or i will put the dividing line in my head but i do think that there is people hungry for just hitting that button and being like oh well here what here's what all my friends were up to in the last 24 hours and being a part of just that like Boop, 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 boop. Oh, okay. Well, this person went there and this person's doing this stuff. And I wonder if they're still doing that. And uh, maybe they're doing fun, interesting things. Maybe they're being adventurous. Uh, and then there is the the Patreon level. And this is kind of where we strata out from a lot of people because we are running businesses on Patreon and we have a vested interest in getting people and keeping people and making them happy and making them feel special. Where like maybe there is for for you know, for, for certainly for modern rogue, you guys have an ability to be like, all right, well, here's on the set stuff. Boom. Now you're getting the literal as it happens behind the scenes. Uh, and for me, I, I don't know what that strata is between, okay, I'll give a political hot take on an Instagram story because I'm the politics guy. But then for my patrons, it's like, should I give an even hotter take? 
<laughs> like, should I should I save that? I, should I, I only think be giving this it is a great, on Patreon? This will be our after things topic. Okay, cool. Let's, let's we'll pick this up in after things. Is there's there's I was I wanted to make a point, but I'm realizing, um, what you want to do that? Yeah, yeah, that sounds yeah, good. Yeah, All right, like, there we go. Hey, we'll by the way, dive. become a patron and you'll get after things earlier <laughs> than anybody else. Um, uh, all right, uh, uh, let, let's actually get into weird things. Uh, yeah, uh, pa- patreon.com slash weird things. Yes. We'll do a deep dive on this because I have some thoughts about social versus pro social and asocial media. Um, gentlemen. Yes. It's time to play a game. Yes. Thank goodness. I've been saying for years we should do a game show. It's, it's kind of like a game show. Yeah. I want you to hold out your hands in front of you like this. I can't, I can't actually see your hands, but that's fine. However, I imagine they're like this, though. Yeah, yeah, like okay, yeah, I want you to imagine you have a stick in your hands. All right, I'm sticking it to the man. You got a stick. <clears throat> and we're going to play a it. game called What Am I Poking? Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll poke first. Um, I poke it and I pay particular attention to whether, it, uh, 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 whether it's hard or soft. Brian, do you go on to Jeopardy and explain to Alex Trebek how the game is played? Oh, uh, sorry. I thought it was... We were supposed to figure out what we're poking, and I made the assumption that we would be poking a thing. But uh, if that's not the case, I stand corrected. I did, did I tell you where we're poking, or did I set the scene for you, Brian? I appreciate I your have enthusiasm. I have a stick. I have a stick. What I, am poke, I, doing with I it? poked Justin with my stick, and I was like, Ow! I'm pretty sure it's Justin Robert Ow, Young. USOB. <laughs> I swear to God, I'll poke you right Brian, in the eye with this Brian, stick. Brian, let me see your stick. I, yeah, I hold up my stick. I take your brick stick and I snap it over my knee. Oh, I say, that's I what say, you get. I say, sweet two sticks, and I poke like, both of them no, at Justin. Brian, you're not getting it. <laughs> oh, no, no, double the stick poke. No. All right, you've got your 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 Brian. I'm going to give you some duct tape. You can duct tape your stick back together. It's like sweet. Ron Weasley's wand. <laughs> I, I I was thinking more like a a, a, a Mace Windu, not Mace Windu. Uh, freaking the uh, uh, what's the name? Yeah. Anyway, I like how when he like when he does his own, you know, Jedi for Skype conversations, he always lights his double lightsabers. You see, he's like, <laughs> just in case you're wondering who I am. I'm the guy with the duct tape double sticks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're walking along. It's going on a merry old little walk. Good it's a big wall, big wall, kind of like a kind of an adult. Adobe, I have a, my face just froze on a wonderful yeah, position. It was great. Pretty great. I was pretty <laughs> new <laughs> avatar. Uh, available at uh, adult stores near you, <laughs> everywhere. Um, we're walking along this Adobe-like wall, and we see kind of a, a hole in the wall. It's a bit of a hole in the wall, right? Uh, wait like, a minute. Hold on. I know. I know this farmer's gambit. Hey, yeah. Question: uh, Are we in France? <laughs> it's a it's at the base of the wall a half semicircle uh-huh okay um it's a very large hole okay well don't run through it, it might be just it on there. if you're going to try something untoward with the hole in the wall and you see something down there Bryce okay. do we have like a, a like a still of this well, yeah here uh, this is this is about what you're looking at oh yeah. I mean yeah, dick can you describe it for our audio listeners yeah you ever you ever see a, a, a labradoodle it's one of those it's clearly I, I used to have one His I didn't even Ollie. think that's the right type of okay yeah <laughs> okay uh, uh, either that like or something you make a uh... lump mm-hmm. that is uh, uh, either wedged into the corner, it almost looks like it's just wedged into the corner of a room, but I think that just might be an optical illusion with the crack where it is in the wall. But it, it, it maybe just so it's like halfway hanging out of a hole in a wall. Now, if, if you squint, it almost looked like looks like there's a shiny spot that might be the glint of an eye and a fold that looks like it might be the muzzle of a mouth. All of a sudden, now I'm looking at it, it looks like a massive close up of a dog's head, uh, but that's not accurate either. So, who's going to be first to poke it? Not me. Oh, I'm poking it right right in the glint. Okay. What do you expect it to do? Uh, uh, number one, I am a total 
a, 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 a total wimp, wimperoo. So I'm going to poke it and then immediately run away no matter what. So I'm going to, I'm assuming it's going to start chasing after me. So I'm going to poke it and immediately run the, 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 the other direction. Brian? Uh, I <laughs> poke Justin again, right oh, as he's God, poking God, the dog. Right in the butt this time, you, I'm trying to poke this and run, and you're poking me. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I just observe, uh, am I able to see, or, or is he poking through the hole and I can't see? Uh, you're standing next to him. Okay, no, 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 but, but, but is he poking through the hole, or we're both in front of this, this thing? You're both standing right. This is the view looking down. This is okay, our great. view. So then, I'm, I'm, I'm poking it. I'm not going to poke it in the glint. I'm, I'm, I'm only it right. I'm going to right in the meat. Ju- Justin is clearly not dialed in. Uh, I, I am only gauging for uh, movement to see if it's alive. Pretty still. It's pretty still. And, and what happens when Justin pokes it and runs away like a scared uh, person? We find out what it is. Oh. oh, oh, all right. Then I'm glad that I ran. Okay. Oh, that's... they said, oh, the coward running like a scalded dog from an inanimate object. Uh, Who you know what? The last laugh now. I don't, I don't, I throw away my stick and I say, I, I, I realize the sticks are a red herring. And I, and I reach down and I just pet it with my hand. Okay. <laughs> I'm 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 like I, I have I have those like knife hands and I'm running as fast as I can. Like... All right, uh, Bryce, we ready to poke it? Yeah, let's uh, let's activate poking mechanism. It really does look like just an old Afghan rug, a black Afghan rug. Oh my God, this is video. It's not a. F- oh, someone pokes it with a stick. Ah! Spiders! 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 So many spiders! Specifically, uh, these are daddy long legs, right? Yeah. They're spindly little little guys. I don't know. Yeah, it was uh, somebody pointed out in the chat. It is a big mass of nesting spiders. Oh, oh my god! So, uh, but what what looked indistinguishable? Uh, Brian was right. It looked like dog hair. Was really just the connected <laughs> legs of. I mean, I don't spiders. even know how to. It's always a spider. Spider. <laughs> <laughs> like spider. Uh, I believe those are daddy long legs, and it makes me think of the uh, the urban legend that said that daddy long legs have the most venomous venom in all the venom land, but their uh, fangs were too weak to penetrate human skin, and that's why it was okay. But that's a totally made up thing. That's not a real thing. Does that mean they're just Wait. not venomous? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Or. Oh, okay. Also, they don't bite. Like, like quite literally, uh, in the scenario, I'd be fine. They'd be crawling all over me, and uh, you'd be okay. A swarm of spiders. I that you just touched. I might. Oh, it smells like a modern to, rogue episode. Oh. I'm trying to think if I've actually done what I accidentally proposed I was going to do. I, I if not, I think I would be comfortable doing it again. Uh-huh. Or if I hadn't done it the first time, doing it <laughs> this uh, uh, for the first time, the second time. Just because, all right, so so you are not, then I'm taking from that, creeped out by spiders, by creepy well, crawly spiders. Well, I, I am creeped out by things that I know can bite me, right? But in general, uh, I, I think I would be cool with daddy long legs crawling all over me as long as I knew I could just sweep them off. Because certainly like uh, crane flies, we uh, uh, we had this little terrier mutt that, that used to, we would say, we would say, Shady, hunt. And then she would, you know, she would, you know, go into laser eyes mode and and i have very fond memories of crane flies and stuff so i think i'd be okay if i if i knew that that it wasn't gonna bite all right what if you had a big old bucket of exactly what we just saw yeah right but then there was one spider in there that that wasn't one of those that would actually hurt you okay now schrodinger's spider flip uh flip flip the story uh okay i have seen one Black Widow in my life, and it was last year, and it was it was terrifying beyond words to me. There is something about being programmed and understanding the power of venom that 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 deeply uh, uh, triggered my uh, my creepy crawler All thing. Right. So imagine one of them the those like like industrial buckets, like the ones that the, the five you know, gallon paint the house. Yeah, five gallon buckets, right? Yeah, filled with those spiders to the brim, mm-hmm. right? In that you don't know where. In that five-gallon bucket is one Black Widow. Nope, 
Not even, not even. In fact, I set fire with extreme prejudice to the entire lot. I flip right. it upside then down. I stomp it, then it we down. We make it. We make it wider. Uh, 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 now it is a bathtub. Nope. Nope. A swimming pool. Nope. 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 For a million dollars. Nope. Look, nope. Hey, look. Th this is a real human bias that we have, where it's like the difference between a hundred percent safe and anything less than a hundred percent safe is when we start to exponentially spend more and more money for, even if it's a totally false promise of complete security. Is that will, will the black widow kill you though? Uh, like push him to shove. Orange is going to the hospital. I mean, it could. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I. I. As I understand it, it can and does. Can, yes, sure. But likely... I would assume that that, that is oftentimes... So you have a medic on on set. This is a, a okay. television show. Okay, it's see, called... then, then that's the magic word. All of a sudden, you just you just undid it because I just realized we shot that segment with the rattlesnake, and, and, and I did pretty much exactly this, messing with the rattlesnake, Then I knew that there was an expert right there. So if there's an expert right there, then... Oh, they don't usually kill... Yeah. Okay. If there's an expert there, then oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Somebody already took that million dollars. Uh, somebody who read that uh, article before you <laughs> already took. Sorry, we're all we're fresh out of millions of dollars. Uh, that's uh, that's that. Oops. Uh, the old uh, uh, daddy long leg swimming pool one black black recluse spider challenge is all tapped out. Hmm. Well, they 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 can bite you. Daddy long legs can bite. They have to be really, really provoked to bite, but it's a mild bite. And there are two different species. There's one species of arachnid that look like daddy long legs that have no venom, but then the spider that you know, the, the actual spider daddy long legs, um, they're just like I don't, I don't, dude, I'm not into biting you. Like, uh, uh, okay, uh, all right, you're happy, and you're like, oh, and then it goes away. Yeah. <laughs> no, you got to really like talk about their mom or something. Like, yeah, get all fired up. Do you guys? Uh, I I don't ever remember consciously seeing or noticing that it was a spider biting me at a time all of the spider bites i've had in all of history i just looked down at my thigh and there's a welt the size of of, of a generous pancake from ihop <laughs> and it and it and it yeah. bur and there's there's three dots in the middle and it burns like fire when i when i put my hand on it and i never have any memory of how or why that that happened uh, yeah, I woke up like a couple weeks ago. Like I've been sleeping out here. My girlfriend and I will sleep out here in the, the we have a couch area out here. And I woke up in the morning and like my leg, like on my foot, like there were several bites all over it. And I think that like some spider or something in the middle of the night, it's like, ah, I hate your feet, you know. <laughs> wow. Or he uh, loves uh, your feet. I don't know if I've, if that's the description of a spider bite, I don't know if I've ever been bit by a spider. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Trey Warren in the chat says that he read somewhere that most spider bites people find out uh, turns out not from spiders. Nope, they're from uh, uh, a wayward uncle. Nos <laughs> Nosferatu. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, there are two different things that we identify as daddy long legs. One group is spiders; the other one's not. So. Um, that's, I don't think that's the official scientific name. <laughs> daddy long legs. <laughs> Yes, yeah, name for name for Ted Longlegs. <laughs> uh, so, little interesting data from the world of science. Somebody calculated the amount of uh, living, or amount of you know, creatures, amount of biomass that spiders consume in a year. Ooh. Oh. And it was something like four hundred billion to like eight hundred billion tons, or something like this, or pounds, or whatever. Well, and that's all, all, all spiders on the planet consume this amount of mass. They could eat every single human being on Earth. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. No, that's crazy. Now, they say that in this, this uh, statistic, the world spider population weighs, um, to show that again, yeah, 29 million tons as much as 478 Titanics. I think we could wipe out 478 Titanics. <laughs> Nature yeah. already did one for us. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, all we need is 600 billion tons of icebergs. Let's go. <laughs> Suddenly, uh, anti-global warming. Like, yeah, if the spiders got their act together, they could eat all of us in a year. 
Uh, we, we, we teased this idea. I think we were originally talking about ants. Would you be more afraid of, because I think we, we were talking about how ants have, you know, a billion times more, however many more uh, orders of magnitude of biomass of humans. Would you be more scared of ants getting their act together and taking on humans or spiders? Because I feel like like spiders tend to be it's it's the independent operators that make me not so scared of spiders. I mean, it'll be annoying as each of them are like, I'm going to be the one to bag a human. Uh, and then it's like, eh, get out of here. And you brush their thing away. But like, I feel like I could never go to sleep if the ants were out to get me. I feel like I would wake up just covered and, and being consumed alive. Well, but but that's more the feeling that's the, the, the I, I think uh, any creepy crawly you would be sensitive to that sensation i guess the idea with ants is that they would probably work a little faster maybe but i don't know whether or not that's true yeah ants can i mean i'm, I'm with you brian because like spiders i have the more uh, reaction to but ants individually are smart and as a group really smart and adaptive and they burrow really you know spiders can burrow but ants are really good at burrowing and adapting you know, I think there's species of ants that look like spiders. They're so good at adapting and sort of blending in. And you could quickly find your house, you know, has a large cavern underneath it, and the ants are waiting for you to fall down and then, you know, dissolve you with fomic acid. So, you know, um, I think we need an ally. I'd rather the ants be our ally in the war. They're oh, ants versus spiders. And and now they're looking for who's who who are the humans gonna ally with. That's an interesting one. Do you see this? Uh, I think I ran across this earlier this week. I'll, I'll uh, email it over to you, Bryce. But uh, there are there are spiders that pretend to be ants. They take their front uh, their front uh, arms. All and right, hold them Brian. Up. It's 2019. They're not pretending. <laughs> The, uh, um, <laughs> but they they pretend to be ants so as to not get attacked by ants. Oh. <laughs> Just uh, me. Oh, I'm sorry. It says here ant. a certain group of jumping spiders mimic ants to avoid being eaten. Small spiders are generally a much easier meal for predators than an army of aggressive ants with strong jaws, painful stings, and formic acid defense mechanisms. So basically, spiders just like, don't mind me. I'm another ant. You mess with me, all my friends are going to come get you because I'm an ant. I have lots yeah. of friends. I'm not a lone hey, spider. Me. Another another ant here. Uh, uh, hey, fellow ants. We're all having a great ant time, aren't we? All right, I'm going to go be alone. <laughs> On the EIB network. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> you know, don't I get it. It's with me, another fellow ant. <laughs> I, you know. Just don't count my legs. Uh, yeah. Oh, what uh, do you mean? No, it's just an optical illusion. It's like that trope that, like, it's been in... Um, they used it in the was it Serenity movie, and it's been around where like if you have to face like the undead or something else like that, you cover yourself in their blood or make yourself look like yeah. them. And I think Walking Dead decided to use that premise too. You know, it's like that. Like we we'll just disguise ourselves as this. We're seeing it uh, a video of it right now. It really does look and move like an ant. And then it uses its antennae that are snap, guess what, arms, and grabs an ant and stuffs them in his mouth. Oh, my God. Oh, that's hilarious. That's that is terrifying. That's amazing. Well, there we go. We have our, uh, we have our double agent. <laughs> <laughs> that's creepy. Nature's weird, guys. It is. Um, one more story, something we've talked about here, and I think we hinted at when we've talked about the records for old age and how sometimes old age records maybe should be treated a little bit when you get a population that seems to be a little older than average. Sometimes it's genetic or real. Sometimes maybe it's suspect. And for the longest time, the world's oldest person, the record has been Jean Calumet. This French woman who lived to be like uh, was 124 or something like this, which was the outlier. And if you looked at what was considered suspect records and what wasn't, hers was considered. You know, if you go look on the the you know the uh, uh, Wikipedia and then people who track these things, you know, they're like, oh no, this is official. Blah blah blah. Um, well, 122 years. Now there's been more and more skepticism about her. Okay. 
in particular, like uh, I think a Russian researcher, mathematician, went in and looked at the the data on that and said that like the problem was is that she was such an there usually you might get one person who's an outlier and then a couple other people in that population who are close to a, a year or two within it. She was such an outlier. He's like mathematically, he showed this to other people like this is just more likely of fraud than there was, you know, some sort of outlier. Um, now there's growing some, and that's been whispered for a while. There's been some for, you know, almost since her, her claim first came to be known, there are people like, mm, we're not so sure. So now there have been some anecdotal stories and stuff that have come out that have said to the fact that like the, uh, that basically this one theory is that it's her daughter. Her daughter assumed the identity of Jean Calumet when the mother passed so they could continue the payments. Oh, and if they look, oh no. Wow. Some people have looked at uh, images of her when she was young and older and noticed a marked difference. Um, and I'm not claiming fraud, but I would say that the claim that the evidence for that is very, very strong. And part of what the, the sort of what happened was that the insurance company went in and looked into this and said, hey, we think the, you know, the benefits company looked in this and said, we think this is su suspicious. The French government said, yes. But we think it's more important that we not expose this because it's how wonderful of a story is this. There we have this, the, the rules all this person, you know, just just drop it. And that was apparently what I mean, who happened. wants to be the person? I mean, outside of the money folk, like money folk, like, yeah, but we're writing the checks for this. We really are not a fan of this fraud. Everyone outside of that. Who wants to be that person championing the cause of like, quit enjoying the belief that you're going to live long? <laughs> Even if it's the money people, because who was paying her? Uh, there was a benefits corporate company. OK. All right. So, yeah, if it, if it was like, like, like an insurance kind of thing, sure. Right. Or, or but, like an annuity or whatever, any of those things. It just, you know. Pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, she's like totally blowing the, blow, taking the top off the, and, and, and uh, the, in an the alternate, actuary table. In an alternate version, I can imagine, you know, it's somebody who works for the government who writes the checks. And they're all like, okay, we're in the business of writing checks to people who are not pretending to be their mothers. I guess I, guess I was thinking it's like, oh, if it was... I don't know. There was some like sponsorship or something. I'm like, look, like the oldest woman in the world loves a Metamucil or something like that. Oh. Right. <laughs> like, like they would have a vested interest in keeping that lady alive for as long as possible. Well, right. Like keeping the legend alive as well. The legend. So, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, you can picture... we sponsor the oldest person in the world. <laughs> can we find them and just say, Hey, we're going to pay you $50 a year to say that you listen to the weird things podcast. Who's the guy that lives in Austin. That is like a the undertaker, a, a world war two vet. That is, uh, he's undead. He's the, <laughs> the undertaker. <laughs> oh, <never died>. oh, <laughs> so from, and, the, and, from the dark side. And let me clear. It's very, this is a big controversy. So we don't know. It, Cause she could have been 122, but there is a lot of skepticism there. And some of the, and it's just from two, cause you get like, one of the defenders says, oh, no, it's her, you know, person who co-authored a book in Calumet said that she had been able to give him the correct answers to questions about things of which her daughter could not have had knowledge. How did you know these things? I mean, I, whenever you hear that, like, it's like the past life, like there's no way they could have known it. How did you know it? You know, like, like yeah. you know, all the details about ancient Egypt, they couldn't have known. How do you know? Oh, because they told me they never read that book. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, you know. So, uh, 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 Trey Warren actually has, uh, uh, I think Brian's answer here. Richard Overton of Austin, Texas died a few weeks ago at 112. Uh, let me see if that's uh, cause I saw a story on, on reddit.com slash r slash Austin celebrating, uh, uh, I thought it was him, uh, uh making it through, uh, a, a, a nasty cold and still kicking around. Uh, oh, did he, oh, he did. He died at 112. That's the guy I'm thinking of. Wow. How about that? So yeah, one twelve uh, was yeah amazing oh wow life. December December of this year yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. or last year rather you know New Year's and all so so if I'm hearing you correctly to your earlier point uh, Andrew um, the the crime uh, or whatever the the tip off was just that not that it was an outlier but that it was just so far beyond that that it became uh, you know orders and orders of magnitude less probable that this was a real story, given how far of the standard deviation it was. Yeah, we've had the, there is the second oldest, Sarah Knauss was supposed to have been 119 from the U.S. 
everybody else, the max is 117. So this was a five year difference. And there's as far as, you know, uh, the, the closest French record to that point was 113. You know. So wait a minute. We could have this record in the good old U.S. of A. if we just discredit this French fraud. <laughs> I mean, I think I think uh, we could have it also by just having someone get past 122. But yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But we could have it tomorrow. We could have it today. Yeah, well, but then who's to say that 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 Miss 119 doesn't get taken down? Hey, what are you a commie? Hey, <laughs> stop, uh, you know, start start pointing your fingers over there. Oh, France. Oh, what are you gonna do? Drink some more red wine and lie about your age? <laughs> <laughs> the oldest yeah uh, American. yeah my my sister-in-law's great grandmother is like 106 oh wow really yep yep oh, she's so we got alert. a player in the game yeah she's alert you know uh we had a new year's eve get together she wasn't there because like they tell her like not to you know do more than one flight every six months or so but um you know it's not a lot of research on that but i mean Wait, just cut them in half and count the rings go, go how hard is that? it Go, go, go back to that list because yeah. I feel like uh, she should be on that list. That that, that Wikipedia list went to uh, 106, right? This, this goes, down to yeah. goes down to 114. It goes down to 114. All right. Yeah. We're edging in. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. old, old age, are you for it or against it? I'm going to fight it. <laughs> Every pick capability I have. I choose to believe it's a false construct. What what does that mean? I just don't believe in it. Sorry. Okay. Right, listen, we all we all we all have our we all we all uh, we all have our choices to make, and I choose to not believe that I'm major. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian. Uh, man, I don't know. I think I think uh, I don't know. You think about like at what point do you just want to punch out <laughs> before you become a, a burden and everything, and forget everything you ever knew and. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's a tough question. I, I, I do wonder, though, how much of that is a byproduct of how you're raised, right? Like even even in your formative years of like nutrition and and exercise and just what what culture was, because, you know, I uh, we're, we're, we're planning this uh, vacation uh, in, in, in the next few months, Ashley and I. And, and part of it was looking back at my family history and like my great grandfather and my grandfather, like they like barely ate anything <laughs> like they, they were lucky to get like a fresh apple every like three months and, and meanwhile i'm getting i'm getting a, a fresh salmon delivered to me like for, for for pennies on the dollar like it's just insane how much better we keep ourselves compared to what what was in the past uh and i don't know i just kind of wonder like what that means just for like, like if all of our human condition is building the best boat and then pushing it out into the, the, the seas of aging, how much longer like you would, it would stand to reason that we would just kick it longer and be alert longer. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, if we're talking about having a healthy life, it's great. I mean, that's the bottom line, but we, we, you know, where if you look at the the leading causes of death right now, and you know the fastest growing ones are basically self inflicted, like you Drug know overdose. fentanyl. Let me try this pill. What what could go wrong here? You know, um, yeah. are things like that? You know, so uh, you know, I think that's yeah, the world like, we live it's in. It's like suicide and drug overdose. Like yeah. those are the those are the fastest growing forms of like like if don't 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 forget uh, uh, obesity. Uh, that's our that's sure. our new like we we're living in uh, too much abundance. We're finally coming up against uh, 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 bill, billions of years of evolution and realizing like okay in an, in a post abundance society uh, how do we how do we not do the things that biologically we're trained to do f forever? Uh, but yeah, I, I think last year or the year before the average life expectancy kind of came down for the first time in in a little while, and it was totally attributed to suicides or suicides and overdoses. Those were the, those are the reasons why we're, yeah. we're dragging the average out. If you take out uh, those two things, like, so you are, you're making, you're, you're paying attention to mental health and, you know, correcting with, with drugs where, where you can, and you are staying away from, you know, overdosable drugs. We continue to live longer and longer and longer. 
The other wild thing is like when you think about uh, old, getting older, uh, th- there are these ratcheting expectations. Like if you make it to 70, then the odds are more likely than not you'll make it to 90. Uh, but it, And if you make it to 80, the odds are you make it to 90, whatever. And then if you make it to 90, the odds are. And then, then at some point it gets a little bit steep. Yeah. Let's keep pushing that further back. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not Brian. You're like, like, when do I, what, like, like, when, when do you punch out? Like, never. I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm, I'm clinging. I'm clinging to this one until the wheels, all the wheels fall off, and the axles both uh, are ground to dust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm waiting, and then I'm gonna go to Proxima Centauri, and you know, go live out there, wait a trillion do- trillion years, and figure out how to escape this universe in the next one when everything starts to fall apart. Yeah, dude. I'm just gonna wait and just get my conscious uploaded to some AIM chat room and just chill out there until we can reconstitute my body. Dude, how yeah, good thought- do you think uh, uh, 50 years from now? How good do you think Hearthstone meta is gonna be? <laughs> so dope. <laughs> So I have a I have a theory like like one uh, I'm increasingly likely to believe yes we are in a simulation um, I, I don't know what happens at the end of the simulation so I'm not going to make any bets as far as what you should do next but as for the purpose of the simulation I thought about this is uh, it's ways for other entities to get entertainment like to say like hey there's another the the base reality they have Star Wars and they have Marvel right. And they've uh-huh. been using our reality because our Marvel movies have been really good. <laughs> but they're using they're using reality X two one zero four four for their new Star Wars films because they're way better than the ones we have. And it's just uh-huh. a source of entertainment. So we but, are inter- we are entertainment in a simulation designed to create entertainment. So we're like we're the 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 fake television show that the television characters are watching on the television show. Yes. Well, I I feel like um, I can use the logic that justifies us being a simulation to sort of cast doubt on the on the idea that we're a simulation. Because one of the one of the logical um, uh, uh, I don't know tricks is to say, wait, you're telling me that uh, uh, of all the possible realities, let's say all of them are fake, and we just happen to live in the real one. But you could also say, wait a minute, of all the simulations, we just happen to be in the simulation that takes place at the exact moment in time when awareness and understanding of technology is uh, brings us to the place where we can understand the possibility of this all being a simulation. That just well, happens that's... to be, of all the simulations run, that just happens to be the one that we're in. Like, well, then... Brian, you're, you're using your particular place in this simulation to say this is why it's absurd where the billions of people that lived before us, no, they didn't get to know this. And yeah, assume... character 5175, what an idiot. <laughs> well, uh, and but... if we assume the simulation's going to run for a long time, then you know, if there's a billion-year history of the simulation, then 99.9% of everybody to ever live in the simulation will be aware of the idea we could be in a simulation. Uh, I, I guess my, my point is, if the hook uh, to someone to cause them to, to be a believer in it is the statistical improbability of us happening to live in the real one surrounded by uh, uh you know billions and trillions of other possible uh simulations running then that same thing makes it seem unlikely that in all those simulations we would happen to be at the one where we happen to be at this moment but then but then that that would be definable from uh no matter where we are it just seems uh uh uh, it doesn't. I. I. I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's not landing. It's and it's fine if that's the case. Well, no. Although, like, if, I guess theoretically, we all we all make our our, uh, our our art based on life, right? Like, we make television shows where they hang out at coffee uh, houses because people hang out at coffee houses. Like, so the idea that somebody would make a simulation about people realizing that they're in a simulation doesn't seem too crazy. Oh, that that is a good counter argument. Well, and also like the, and I, I right now I'm, I've frozen where I'm giving Brian like the, some, this the, perfect, yeah. for, for, for skeptical the record, for the for, for, for the vast majority of the people that listen like there's uh, uh, only listen and don't watch the video just understand that part of the giggles that are happening is that Andrew keeps freezing in very funny places. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and the simulation argument is really old though. I mean, it goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. So you have the idea of God dreaming things like this. So. Uh, we yeah, have our uh, version of it, which I don't necessarily think is the accurate version of it, 
it's how we frame it in an early 21st century point of view. So, yeah. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> all right, let's do some picks. Yeah. Picks, 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 picks. Hey, I got a pick for y'all. Yep. Listen, you know me. I like digging down deep. Digging deep into the record bin to find the gems that you simpletons have missed. <laughs> Which is why I'm here to tell you that True Detective Season 1 is very good. <laughs> Wait, are you only just now seeing it? Yes. Oh my god. Wow. Uh, uh, number one, we were you're... looking for something to watch on Friday, and we were like, "Oh wow, well let's let's watch something that's like old. That's like you know, not everything has to be the new thing that's happening. Like, let's watch the uh, let's watch some old stuff." And I knew that the new True Detective was debuting. Uh, I guess it's this weekend, and so I'm like, "Let's watch the first season of True Detective." Uh, man, it's good. I also think, uh, considering. Uh, I'm I'm right up into the season finale, which I've heard is disappointing. Uh, so I think I might just stop watching all True Detective from here. No, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I thought the finale was pretty good. I, I, good. I love the finale. Yeah, you like the finale? The okay, finale. good, 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 good. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. No, as a matter of fact, anyway. I'll I'll go a step farther and say, uh, you know, we I think we all experienced season two in the week to week, week, week yeah. uh, which I think unfairly dings it. I think that binging season two. Even season two, like I, I like season two. It just had twice as many characters as think, it should have. I think there are some texture parts of season two that binging won't save, right? Like I don't think you'll. Uh, who is um, who is the famous guy in season two? Vince Vaughn. Vince Vaughn. You can't like unwrite some of the cheesy stuff. Vince sure, Vaughn but says but in but two. I do think that it's unfairly dinged because it was being watched, you know, week over week by by us and and and. Our our crew. That um, seems plausible. I I would say. Yeah, I I think I think and and Colin Farrell is I think better than than people want to remember him at uh, as and yeah. I, so I, season I, one of True Detective, <laughs> uh, uh, I I've I've really really liked and uh, it's really good. Uh, I don't know what I can say about it that hasn't already been said. Uh, uh, other than, man, it's great to see great actors do uh, something that complex and it really is when, when you look at that uh that show obviously we already knew that that matthew mcconaughey was great we already knew that uh what's his face was uh, amazing uh the 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 breakout oh, what's his face oh what's his face <laughs> whose name i can't remember right now Woody harrelson woody harrelson woody harrelson although like he to me is the the, the breakout star of of that season as he you know kind of unfolds into this more complex character. And I kind of am in love with the story that I think uh, we'll, we'll, I'll see where it ends, obviously, but it kind of like has this, this, uh, uh, Leo, like, like kind of like peaks in its interest and, and excitement and mystery in the middle. And then kind of like slowly sort of unravels in a way that I've, uh, I've, I've really, really enjoyed. It sounded like you were about to talk about the breakout scene. Did you watch the making of that thing? I have not. No, I've literally just been watching the show. Yeah. hundred percent analog, no digital, nothing. And when you see the choreography, cause it's a, it's like what it's a, like 11 or 12 minute uninterrupted shot. And yeah. knowing that there's not one wit of splicing together two takes makes it truly, do uh, we, it's, do we know that though? Uh, well, they, they did a featurette showing from the yeah, outside, the entire but, thing. But I, I mean, I, 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 I believe it's possible, but like I've, I've known is, that other movies that go, oh yeah, this is one long take, and it's like, well, there are three cuts, and we know that <laughs> this, is, this is Andrew's death taxes, and Andrew not believing it's all one cut. <laughs> no, I, I do. <laughs> let me make this clear. Let me make this clear. I love that sequence, and I have, I have no trouble thinking the way they pulled that off. But there is a pattern in Hollywood of, hey, yeah, we did this long take, and then you find out that, well, no, they did. They did. They spliced it, and you can actually see where and whatever. But the story is much more interesting to say we did one long take. Um, and I love that. I love that sequence in there. It's a really, really great sequence. But, but I'm just saying, Hollywood sometimes lies, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I well, remember I, I, correctly, here's, here's all I'll say. For whatever reason, when everybody was raving about that show and raving about that scene in particular, I had always I knew that there was a long, uh, a long single take shot that was amazing that everybody loved. 
and I knew it wasn't in the final couple episodes because I remember it, people raving about it while the show was still going on. But in my mind, I had always uh, uh, thought of it as a bar scene, that something happened at a bar that was a long, unbroken take. And so it kind of took me by surprise, which was an amazing treat because it's so great. Yeah, it's six minutes, not 12 minutes. But uh, it's great. Uh, it's, tell you what, it feels clear. like it. it, it uh, it certainly feels like, uh, you know, he goes off. It's like, hey, come on. We're going to go and do this one take shot <laughs> you know, just so we can do it. But I guess my larger point is I really wanted to watch True Detective having seen Maniac because the DP of True Detective season one is the creator of the Netflix series Maniac, which is director. Like just, he was, he director. was the director of Maniac. OK, OK. And True Detective. Okay, yeah. was he not the was he not the creator of Maniac? No, Maniac. He was is... a co-creator of Maniac. Co-creator of Maniac. Okay, but the Netflix uh, Maniac sorry. is an ad- adaptation of another show called okay. Maniac. Got you. All right. Yeah. Uh, 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 the visual stylings of uh, 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 that dude, Carrie uh, uh, Carrie Joji, Joji Fukunaga. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you took the bullet on that one. <laughs> uh, that was uh, that was something that I was uh, uh, it made me really excited to do it. Uh, True Detective is uh, a masterwork, and I am pumped to watch the finale. Yeah. Did uh yeah. did I already spend a pick last week? Did we do a show last week? Um, talking about uh, the Dark Tower and going back and doing that again. You did. And uh, uh, specifically, let me let me go a tangent from that. I'm sure I talked up how great uh, Frank Muller is as an audiobook reader. Did I mention that I'm listening to Moby Dick? His reading of that from the 1980s. And uh, it's great because it takes what I think as a book would have been tedious and frustrating language. But instead, he uh, the audiobook reader, Frank Muller, read literally anything he's ever read read. Um, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I know that he breathed new life into 1984, which I had already read, but experienced with a fresh set of eyes. Same thing happening right now with Moby Dick. He. Um, has this ability to uh, speak in a way um, because he knows where this sentence lands, because he knows the intended purpose of the sentence. He's able to give, uh, you know, uh, cues to to get your head in the right space so that it just it reads in a way that um, uh, that feels very 21st century. Strangely, it's wonderful. You know, the wonderful thing about the book, and I think it's right at the beginning is when they describe a whaling ship Mm -hmm. and it's such a great idea uh, explaining of like it's not like this thing just went out and they got whales and they came back you know they're harvesting the whales they're processing the blubber the coal the black black smoke coming off the ship they're factories and it's just this in melville i think it worked in the industry for a while and had experience there and it's such a you know from a, a story point of view it's a it's a really great example of a historical fiction written during that period that includes details that it's hard to press to imagine anybody a hundred years later thinking about that. I loved uh, specifically how inauspicious the book began with the awkward need to share a bed with a stranger and uh, the abject horror just to listen. And it's great to hear the audiobook because Frank Muller really sells it as Ishmael's like, WTF, this dude was bald, like on purpose, like he shaved his head. And I, th- I saw these black squares all over him. You're like, what's going on? They're tattoos. Have you ever heard of such a thing? And it's like, you could tell that that this is somebody who, you know, is about to encounter a much larger world. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it, it, it really survives, uh, what, nearly 200 years now? Is how long it's been? 150, 60 or something like this. Yeah. Crazy. Long time. Anyway, uh, uh, specifically Frank Muller's reading of Moby Dick. That's what I'm doing. Cool. Bryce? I have a pick. Uh, on Sunday, this started, and it's going to be going until uh, like midnight on Sunday. Uh, but it is time for uh, the Games Done Quick stream uh, marathon going on right now. Uh, oh, I did not look at this before I clicked this over, so they're doing an interview. But uh, it, this is like a seven-day like nonstop marathon where... Uh, people, speedrunners from around the world get together in one place and, and they play through video games as fast as they can. And, uh, it's, it's really cool. And, and it's, it's exciting to see, like, especially if it's a game that, you know, right. Um, you, you get to just see them like basically tear into, you know, something, something that, you know, right. 
Um, this year they're doing a nine and a half hour speed run of Final Fantasy Nine, which will be that'll be pretty cool. Um, and and they're non they're nonstop, man. That like they did they did Final Fantasy Seven a few years ago, and it was, uh, it it was like that. It was the guys on the couch, not stopping, not taking breaks, not you know s switching off. Uh, but it's very cool, and uh, it's it's all streaming for free on uh, on Twitch, um, uh, until Sunday. So, I don't know. Do you guys ever check out any of the games done quick stuff? Uh, I I have, and you're you're right in that. You get a boost when you know the game, but it's the games that I don't know that either it's got to be very, very short or um, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> or, or because because uh, the star of the show is not the personality uh, in the moment because they're too busy doing a skill based thing that is very, very hard to do. And that's why it's extraordinary. It depends. Uh, like uh, it, it depends because sometimes you have a, uh, a runner who will actually be really charismatic and talk stuff through. Though also the, we'll have people on the couch who, have, who are mic'd up and, and can, we'll talk through stuff also. There are not too many like silent runs. Right. Um, but yeah, and, and they run the gamut from like there are some 15 minute blocks. There are some like multi-hour blocks. I remember a few years uh, ago I saw a nine minute uh, by taking advantage of, an ex, of, of a bug exploit. I saw a nine minute uh, finish of Fallout, Fallout 3. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, where you you break the game while you're a child, and because the game thinks you're a child, nobody attacks you. Yeah, and then you and then you're able to like uh, run through. You find a secret no clipping place, and you just run to vastly different parts of the map, and so on. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, cool stuff. I, I will say I have not gotten into the the ADQ streams, uh, but I did fall into one night a YouTube hole of speedrunning documentaries, mm -hmm. which are fascinating. Yeah. Like just just uh, 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 when you condense all the like hacking and, and where like how long records have lasted and then who broke them and when they broke them and who they were and where they were in the community. Like that's the kind of stuff that I really, really dug. So I, I do know that that ADQ is a huge part of Twitch uh, culture and it raises a ton of money. So I would encourage everybody to go watch it and donate money if you are into it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I took a deep dive reading about negative worlds in some of the games, some of the older games. Oh, which, like uh, uh, when you get under the terrain of uh, yeah the, the areas collision. that are not supposed to be part of the playable game, but are used because of like data and stuff. I mean, it's just just uh, fascinating. Yeah. I have a uh, two picks. Um, I uh, I too like to see myself as sort of a vanguard on culture hipness things that are really really cool and and just new talent really i, I consider myself a good eye for we get talent. it your pick yeah. is moby dick <laughs> <laughs> um better um turns out the director of the movie get out used to be a comedian <laughs> and, and did a comedy show <laughs> Ah, but it was just him, just solo, or um, yeah, he worked with another gentleman. Oh, <laughs> who who has who is you know now an actor oh. in movies and stuff. Um, I'd watched Mad a TV. few. Mad TV, sorry, Mad yeah. TV. <laughs> yeah, Mad, exactly. I, that you steal my punchline there. Um, um, I I had watched a couple Key and Peele sketches, and there were things that, like I'll get around to watching this more. The funny thing is, I've had friends who've actually acted and been in sketches with them. And I knew they did this at the time it was being made. I knew people worked on the crew and all this. But I never really did the deep dive. And then a lot of them ended up on YouTube. And I did a deep dive into them. And I'm like, oh, my God. This is so, so much better than anything I've been seeing from anything else. And 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 they those guys, of course, they're hugely talented. But it, it's worth going back in there and kind of watching, uh, particularly with, you know, Jordan Peele is to go look at, like, this guy's now – you know, on his ascendancy as a director and what he's doing, what he did to get out. He's got now us and he's, you know, the twilight zone and key is, it's, they're all brilliant. And it's just, just really need to kind of go back there and go watch and sort of go like, you never know what's really going on. It's like, um, that dude on the office, I think he could have some potential too, <laughs> you know, you know, but I did that. And yet, but a, a new thing I've been watching, uh, the Kaminsky method on Netflix. Oh, oh yeah, a yeah, big, yeah, yeah. Uh, that... big, big, big uh, 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 standout at the Golden Globes last night, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Best TV uh, series written by it's a uh, Chuck Lorre with other writers, but uh, created by Chuck Lorre, starring Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin. Uh, Alan Arkin's an aging agent. Michael Douglas is an actor who actually has been a, an acting coach. 
and their their friendship dealing with starts off the tragic sort of situation, but really well written, very very funny and likable. So, um, the Kaminsky method. Cool. Recommend it. So there you go. Yeah. It's been weird. Dang right. Uh, so here, Bonnie split. So I'm gonna make sure the kids are alive, and then we could jump in into after things and okay. and talk about how nonviolent Snapchat employees are. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Yeah, we'll do that. Considering I ran off to the bathroom during the show, I can stay here with you, Bryce. Hey, there we go. We can do that. Did you have a good weekend, Juice? I did. I I had a, a, a fairly productive weekend. Yeah. I don't want to break a. I don't want to break a streak here. Nice. Oh. But we seven days into 2019. Yeah. And I have gone to sleep seven days with inbox zero in my main email wow that's incredible i don't i think about uh i could probably get to like maybe inbox 10 if i really scrubbed stuff but i i have so much stuff in there what are what are what are what are the barnacles uh it's stuff it's it's a lot of stuff that like i said i would do and does not have a time limit or like someone sending in a question to me about like something that we do here um which also is not time sensitive and and thinking one day i'll just see this and i'll just knock this out uh at at the risk of being the guy who does cbd oil and now thinks that cbd (laughs) oil is the only thing that matters i think inbox zero might be the key to all of my the productivity yeah like i feel like when i'm at inbox zero and therefore Every time I see an email, I'm like, ah, one email, Meh. do it. Send send the quick thing, uh, uh, do the quick thing, be done with it. Don't use your inbox as your to-do list. Yeah. Like, Though you almost uh, kind of are using it as a to-do list if you are trying to, like maybe not the fastest to-do list, but. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I like to feel like it's, it's something where I'm just taking instant action. So yes, like, my to-do list is like there's this conveyor belt with pies that's coming down and i have to put a cherry on each pie right yeah uh instead of spinning them on my fingers while i then try to apply cherries with my toes um but i kind of feel like it has been a tremendous help for uh uh, a lot of uh, uh feelings of overwhelm like feelings of like uh, I've abandoned causes that I'm, I'm, I, I just look at these barnacles in my inbox and I just see blinking failure. Yeah. Like I, and, I liked your yummy metaphor though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the pies. Um, I, I, I don't, I wonder what it is because there's, I will go into Gmail when I see, when I get the notification that there's an email that I need to look at that's kind of what will get me in there and and kind of getting rid of stuff um but otherwise i i i is is gmail like your home page or something because i wonder if that's a part of it and like i don't i i it like my routine is not even to go to gmail if i have an email that i get that will get me into the email i am in my email dozen a dozen times a day at yeah. least but really the big thing is this oh. and i might even be able to do it i'll do it for you guys right here i'll do my live performance of inbox zero oh please do oh he's got the phone out so i don't know if you guys can see oh yeah, it's your right. auto adjust is not gonna work um, oh just turn the brightness down on your phone okay see if that'll do it oh, yeah. yeah there you go yeah nice all right, so I got two emails, right? Okay. Sure. Uh, one is something that I've already set up a, t- a time for. Yeah. Swipe Figure it that out. out. Ooh. It's another thing that I've already done. Yeah. Now watch this. Okay. Big, yeah. What sun? What, what app is this? That's big, just the Gmail app. Inbox. This is the Gmail. Well, this is in- inbox, so it, it might go away yeah. when they push me out of this thing, but I'm gonna cling to it like a like a a, a squatter. Until they until they move the bulldozers in on Inbox. Inbox is but, so good. It like when I got the new phone, I didn't install Inbox because I knew that they said they were gonna sunset it. 
But it's such a shame because Inbox is really good. And the Gmail app is like not quite there yet. I yeah, I'm. I swear to God, there is an element that I just I have visceral anger toward Google that they have taken away like things that I interact with on a daily basis away yeah. from me multiple times. I, it's like once once every five years, Google takes away something that I use every day. I stopped using their their on the browser their webmail client. I stopped using that. I went to on my desktop. I now I'm using Apple Mail. Yeah. Um, just because like once they changed the, the 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 redesign of Gmail for me was just too a bridge too far. Yeah. Um, I'm trying. I I'm not on the inbox desktop. Like I think inbox is not good on the desktop. Um. I think I ended up switching over. I think they forced everyone to the new version of Gmail, but it's it. I know it loads slower, and I do, I don't know what reason there. Like I like I I guess they added a toolbar, and you can do to do stuff from there. But I'm I don't keep Gmail open all the time, and it's not in my homepage, so all that stuff just feels like getting in the way. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh... I think more of it is 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 a, is a philosophical thing for me of just being like, oh look, like here is a monument to the fact that I do things. Yeah. Like I I know that I do things and I know that I clear things out and it just like, I don't know. It feels like getting up earlier in the morning or something. <laughs> like there's just like some <laughs> kind of like like when I don't know if it's for everybody. I just know it's for me that I feel like good. I feel like exciting. Like, I feel like I should have a special hat. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about Inbox Zero, Bry. Oh, I'll get there. Yeah. I only have two more years to go. Is it working I, my way back? I'm, I'm into Inbox, don't give an F. Well, and, and that's the biggest thing. Like, that's strangely what gives me the... It is... A, maybe maybe this is an after things thing. Because I, I have strong opinions. Um when when you're when you're making good to work your way back through emails from two three four years ago, it's astonishing how little of it is relevant or matters and didn't or couldn't take care of itself or whatever. IRS. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I, you know, my theory was like I started to like turn my phone off till like eleven a.m. like not let gift take phone calls. And my theory thinking was, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> you know, there is yeah. no emergency in the world where I should be the first person somebody tries to get hold of. My, I have mine. I, I might do that in the evening instead at like midnight or one a.m. because anything coming in after that time can probably wait if I'm not looking at my phone. Yeah. Uh, cool. So yeah, maybe that can be something in after things. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we're gonna talk about stories. The social media feature called Stories, rather. <clears throat> All right. Uh, you guys good to go? Feeling it. Yes. Yeah. All right. Take it away. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Ooh, almost caught me off guard. Brian Brushwood. True fact. These are all true so far. Can't vouch for everything after this. Justin R. Young. Hey, gang. It's me. <laughs> We started a conversation in Weird Things talking a bit about social media stories and how we interact with these things. And and I think that uh, Brian and I are kind of in the camp of like, well, we're entertainers. This better be for an audience or for a purpose. Uh, would you agree with that, Brian? Yeah, uh, although... Um, uh... Not not as a universal indictment of of the platform itself. Oh just, no, not just, an I, I just more indictments on you and I. Correct, correct. Yeah, we we are we are outliers in that it's like, look, man, uh, if, if 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 I make my money from showing my mug and saying things I think, then uh, I want as many people to see that as possible at all times. Yeah. Versus you know Justin who does both, but Justin has sincere non-professional relationships with people i understand you know people interact they're with called that humans are, are I, i'm told they're great sure uh, well i mean i i think that it's it's partially 
my my idea of the uh, at least my career is that there are kind of two elements to it. There's the like get people into the tent and then there's the entertain people when they're in the tent and hopefully make money on them or hopefully have them want to spend money on you, right? Uh and and to me although getting uh getting going on something like Snapchat or, or Instagram stories was hard and I I found that it is almost completely tied to my self esteem at the moment when i feel good about myself and my life i post more and i do more and i think of things to do and say more when i'm not i post less if at all man and that and, uh, and uh, if uh, any Second in right. on that, and that's that's a case even on a platform like Twitter where where like uh, that makes money because uh, I say a thing and and each one's a scratch off lottery ticket. One out of ten times, a lot of people retweet it, and then more people know about my stuff or whatever. And and and, and like if you're playing the game of gathering attention, that's an important thing to do. And even knowing that this is my my f wording job, um, it's just a hundred percent tied to how am I feeling. You know, and and yeah. when I'm not feeling it, I it's really hard to want to talk and tell stories. Yeah, I I've been like last year, my Facebook usage. Uh, I went on there to go post that I have a new book. I've done that. Other than that, uh, I don't know if I did. Did I do any live streams last year on Facebook? If I did, I did a couple for live streams. That was it. I've not used it as a mean to interact. I've not checked my Facebook email accounts. Um, Instagram, I'll do Instagram minimally just to go like my friend sort of stuff to try to, you know, keep the veneer of a human. And then <laughs> Twitter, even Twitter's more, I'll go say something on Twitter and interact with people. But I, I'm such an disengaged outlier in all of this. Well, and, and but also what you're, what you're describing as, as a disengaged outlier is pretty much as best I could tell, the universally accepted norm for a novelist. It, it, is, it is not the norm for a, a, a cult of media personality, but it is the norm for, for, for being a popular novelist. I would, I don't, I mean, I know a lot of writers who are way more active on Twitter than I am. You know, George R. Yeah, R. No, Martin, I, I Stephen would, King. I would say, a... Yeah, I think, I think that, that in this day and age, uh, uh, I, you know, a, a fair amount of the people that I see retweeted a lot primarily make their money writing books you know, uh, be usually fiction. Uh, then again, I mean, that, that just means, I mean, that, that's like just the, the, the Twitter quandary of the fact that like literally everybody on Twitter is exponentially more important because everybody on Twitter or uh, everybody in media is on Twitter. However, however that is. And so it's just reflected in news and movies and fiction and, and, and everything on such a large level compared to, how many people actually use it on a daily basis? I'm I, I I think I was thinking about the idea that there's sort of a delineation. There's social media and there's pro pro social media, and you know, Brian, Justin, you guys are you're professionals who make money on social media. You know, you're you're so your your engagement there is a professional level. It is really part of your job. Everybody sort of says, oh, social media is part of my job. But I know a lot of people at companies. If you if your company didn't tweet for a year you would be fine. But you guys, it's very much. And I was thinking about part of the problem that some actors and people have with social media is that they start off with their friends and then they get fans and this is cool. And then when they get criticism, it's hard for them to deal with where we come from places where like, no, we've had hecklers. We've had this. We get it. We walk into a room. Not everybody's going to like what we do. And we've already developed sort of the, you know, the immunities to that. But other people haven't. Yeah, it's rough. I had a, a, a somebody in my timeline today was uh, retweeting a, a director of a movie that is in theaters now that literally just had to be vanity searching the name of the movie or or vanity searching his own name. He wasn't tagged in it and he just lit up this dude for not liking his movie. Uh, uh, and it's like part of it is I mean, the point that that the guy in my timeline was making is that like Twitter is the place where uh, uh many celebrities find criticism right and because it's the only mm -hmm. place in which 
they can easily go seek it out, you know? <laughs> a, a wise uh, man once explained all of Hollywood to me as, you're great. Oh, this is amazing. This thing, it's the biggest thing ever. Eh, it just isn't right for us right now, but you're great. Everything you do yeah. is great. You're the best. Oh, God. If it were for the idiots upstairs, uh, we would all be gigantic uh, superstars. So, you know, uh, true as fact, soon as they I die, meant... and I'll tell you what, I might kill them. Okay. I might kill them after lunch. True fact, I wanted to come into this meeting wearing a T-shirt with your face on it, but my boss said no. He said, if you do that, you're fired. And I said, well, then, uh, then consider me fired. And then he said, but I'll also kill your family. And that's the only reason I'm not wearing it now. Yeah, I love my family. I think we all agree on that. Something that I love you about. Everybody loves everything. And I had a, an exchange recently with somebody I know who uh, wanted me to take a look at something. It's like, yeah, it's it's in development at such and such studio. Now, last I talked to this person, they had they were talking to a production company that was on the lot at the studio, but it wasn't in development there. And I'm like... When I try to be polite about it, I'm like, well, wait, is it in development at this studio, your project? And he's like, no, but they're taking it to the, to the head so-and-so who really loves it, and it's fast-tracked. What, like, what I meant to say is the situation is developing with this studio. And, and I understand. I understand his point of his enthusiasm. I get that. I've been there. But it was like it's, it's part, part of it, too. It's like if you've never been to really had a thing in Hollywood, you don't know how to read it. When they say we love it and they're excited, they want to see it, that is the – that is the that's every door that's what the doormat says when you walk in the building we love this you're special you're excited we can't if if, if they don't say that you know worry but they that's the normal that's the hello in hollywood we love this we're super excited and we want to make this thing happen and so i watched kind of this and then how that to his mind was well that's as good as it being already optioned already in development and fast tracked at the studio you know yeah. it's like and it's like it's partially the wishful thinking and partially this mentality in this town it's just this yeah everybody loves everything well, because it, it's it's a relationship town. Yep. So the one thing that you the one way you know you can fail is by insulting somebody, right? Yeah. You always want them to believe, like, oh no no no, I'm your best friend, because at the point that you're valuable, I want you to know, I thought you were amazing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that that is, yes, I think that's part of the problem with a lot of celebrities. Celebrities is everybody's kissing their butts. Everybody's telling them this. Then all of a sudden they go on Twitter, type in their name, and they see this. And then, you know, and it's just funny. I want the, the, the idea of a director getting upset and deciding to engage with somebody who did not like their thing. Yeah, it was Adam McKay, and then he accused somebody of ignoring the Iraq war because he didn't like Vice. Oh, wow. That's funny. That's... Or at least, uh, I, I don't know, it was, it was a screen grab, so I'm assuming it was real. But Yeah. Uh, okay. Me um, meanwhile, there's, some, there's something to, like, uh, uh, old-fashioned showbiz folk, where it's like, we're, I'll say we're, uh, broken to begin with, which is why we got into showbiz. We show up on street corners where people tell us we're garbage, and we're like, I know, but I also think I can fool you with this dollar bill trick. <laughs> And then, and then somehow Twitter comes along, and it's just I uh, uh, I don't know. It's it's it's. I mean, not that that all social media hasn't figured out how to get each of our individual goats at some point. Uh, it it does feel like uh, I think immunity was the word you used, Justin. Like uh, we'd already built up the antibodies for that kind of thing. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that part of it is, you know, there is an element of being on the internet to understand when things become uh you know, even if we don't learn the lessons we know the tales right like we all we all know like oh i i uh, why are you still up someone on the internet is wrong like we know mm -hmm. that that's a bad instinct to have whether or not we heed it is a different story but there's there is just some element of like okay well uh this is productive this is unproductive and it's something that i very much like if there's one thing that i want to work on a muscle that i want to work out specifically the further i get into the political world which you know even though like my brand is literally we all have points let's discuss the points like i'm not i'm going to eschew taking the like super easy hot takery because i'm committed monastically to to uh, trying to to understand where everybody is coming from 
uh, even then, it's like I was very excited because I, I realized that the podcast was breaking into a wider audience when I read my some of my Patreon exit surveys after the midterms uh, uh, of why people were leaving. And it was just people disagreeing politically about stuff. And I'm like, OK, good. They came in <laughs> for the midterms and I'll bet you they'll be back for the general. <laughs> Uh, so resolved uh social media so let's move on to uh uh inboxes uh justin did i hear right you you uh in just before the we started recording we're we're bragging on your inbox zero your zero seven days into 2019 brian and i have gone to sleep seven nights in a row with my inbox at zero when i lay my head on the pillow that's cool (laughs) <laughs> that's um, how you're gonna set yeah i mean i mean I, I mean what you're describing is you you got the holy grail and that's certainly something that i i know it's me bragging about my digital abs like i know i know that it's something that nobody wants to hear about nobody likes i just for, for me personally it was something where i had slowly been working toward it over the last year right like i've been like trying to like periodically kind of eliminate it uh, and then I was over the holiday and there was just a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, I had, I was able to kind of clear out. Then I had those like pesky barnacle emails, like those emails that are like right down there in the bottom and maybe they've been there for a while. And it's somebody that you really, and for me, it was an old friend of mine that I used to do comedy with that earlier last year, I had just reconnected with him out of nowhere and was like, Hey man, like let's let's do something, and and it was like a cool back and forth, and then he had emailed me, and then it was just one of those. The longer it went, the worse I felt about it, and uh, I just had to bite the bullet and just be like, I'm a butt. Uh, let me answer all these questions that you had from a million years ago, just so I can get that poison out of my life uh, of of it staring at me and. Uh, being a beacon to my inability to finish things. Uh, and and now it's like, all right, you want to know what? Like inbox zero, inbox zero is way easier to maintain than it is to get there. Yeah. Because I was describing to, to Bryce, it's like, all right, periodically things kind of come in, but also it's like, it just forces you to think when you only have one thing, it's like, okay, does this go on my to-do list? Does it go on my calendar? Does it go somewhere else? But like, all I know is it doesn't belong here. So I can just get it the hell out of here, put it on my calendar, put it on my to-do list. Ninety-nine percent of them are that, or it's a a, a a a quick email, even if it is just a push back at them to be like, like, all right, yeah, I'll I'll get to that. But even then, it's like uh, to me, it, it's it developed my ability. I'm a very, and I'm sure everybody on this call knows that sometimes I can take a long time to do things uh, uh, and and I can be lazy about it and it's try I, I'm trying to work out those muscles of like no you want to know what like let me not just send the like hey what does this mean or like ask another question just to know that it's getting out of my inbox uh, but like let me just look up the thing I know that I could probably look this up in a couple minutes and it's easier to do when I only have one of those instead of doing one of those while I'm looking at a bunch of other totems of my ineffectiveness. I have, I have two thoughts. And one is I was thinking about this the other day, the idea of, you know, in, in, in software programming, we use APIs, which, you know, if you send a little, you know, piece of code to an, you know, Twitter's API, you know, you can post things, something on Twitter or, you know, APIs, are these sort of these gateways to do stuff. And I think about the idea, if you had your own personal sort of API, you know, like, you know, an address or a URL or whatever, and um, ways in which you could, mit- just for contacting or communication, because so much of what you want to do is automatic. So much of what you want to do is, I don't know, just I want I want all of my, you know, like the inbox thing tries to do where it puts together all the promo emails and puts it in one thing. But I could direct all communications from Justin into something else. He could send me a text or an email, but it could automatically just become a text message for me, or I could have a bot that reads this sort of stuff from unknown senders and responds to it. Uh, you know, getting into the idea of, you know, for, for close friends is giving them, you know, special keys that encrypt their con- you know, communications and stuff. 
I'm just thinking like, I don't know. I, it's a nebulous idea, but the idea of if we want to get to the point where we have the 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 AI butler or whatever that handles yeah. everything, we need to have control over it. It shouldn't be Google or no. Facebook deciding what gets through. Oh God, yeah, no, that would be amazing. If if I could if I could have something that I controlled that it was like local to my phone and local to uh, uh, my computer, I would I would absolutely love that. Uh, re real real quick footnote on the on the inbox zero thing. Uh, part of it was last year I separated my I separated separate emails for each show email. So like all the 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 jury emails go to a jury daily at Gmail. All the Politics emails go to the young American at Gmail. Periodically, I'll still get some stuff into my personal email, but I can just forward them. I know where they go. That's the only reason why I have Inbox Zero. Otherwise, I would always be lazy enough to not put it in the doc where it's supposed to go. I would always just leave it there until I absolutely needed to push it. Yeah. Um, so se uh, separate thought, like uh, the whole, I, 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 you know what? I do feel like uh, 20, 2019 will very likely be when I actually get to Inbox Zero, but it will be because uh, at this point, um, I, I, I just I refuse to just hit mass delete on everything from 2014 and 2015. There, there is a mass 1,200 emails from that time that at some point I looked at and decided they were important enough that I shouldn't dismiss them out of hand. Some of them are ideas for episodes of Scam School episodes. Some of them are business opportunities. Some of them are, uh, some of them are garbage or whatever. But as I, and, and my game is always to work my way back until what I think of as the back catalog. And then once I hit the back catalog, then just things breeze through. Because it turns out half of everything is garbage that fixed itself and doesn't matter. And so I'll send a courtesy courtesy one line response of like hey however did that turn out and and then people are thrilled to hear from me two or three years later now i'm, I'm not going to say this is a good way to do it but uh but i am going to say that um uh it is astonishing to me how little was actually of any import whatsoever once you have the distance of a year two years three years after the fact and how much of our time gets swept up in that can i can i so you have all your scam school and modern rogue emails go into they they funnel into your personal email past or tense. is that a separate past tense? Yes, past tense. It did. Yeah, but but still, I mean, people people know who the point of contact person is for each of those shows, sure, and sure, it's sure. not but hard least, to get. But, my... but the, now you can see those and just hit forward to the appropriate place and then deal with it when you go deal with other stuff. Oh, I don't even do that. Usually, what I'll do you is. <laughs> Like, uh, like, like, like I'll see it. And, and if it's something that is like, oh, this is something worth doing. Oftentimes it's people trying to book me for a thing or get me on their podcast yeah. or whatever. And very quickly it becomes important where it's like, you know, I, I, and I'm sure, I'm sure both of you gentlemen have had this where it's like, you get booked on a podcast and five minutes into it, you realize nobody's going to hear this. This is, this is a fan who's thrilled to have captured my time and and is just is so excited for this hour long conversation they're going to have with me that they really promise is an up and coming new property or whatever. So what I tend to do when it comes to getting booked on stuff is uh, if I have the free time, sure, you know, go ahead and commit to doing it. But if I don't have the free time, I, I put I hand them the ball back and say, hey, really unlikely anything's going to happen this month. If I were you, I would say hit me up again in March. And then now. That is a self-selecting uh, 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 filter where if they're serious or if and by then, plus also half the time it's people starting a new podcast and then they don't even know if it's going to still, you know, I don't know if it'll still be around in March. But if they're if it's still going in March and they hit me up a second time, that has orders of magnitude more weight with me and grabbing my attention and getting me all the way dialed in. I yeah, see, I hear you and, and I. I don't mind like if somebody says, "Hey, I want to do a podcast." It's me, and it, they're only their cats are going to listen. If I have time, I don't mind. I mean, so I do the Periscope sessions and stuff, and and but I never have the time. <laughs> you know, that's my problem. Is like I always try to give myself. Like right now, I'm writing a book, and I don't have I, I have almost no commitments this month because I want to give myself time to write the book. Now, most of this time spent writing the book is going to be sitting around watching Netflix. 
thinking, <laughs> well, what's it, next? What do I need to do next? All uh, that. I, I think the important thing is having a place that is the most effective place for them to put their energy. Uh, I, I forwarded over to to Justin. You know, somebody somebody hits me up with like, hey, I really need help on this. And and look, there's no there's no shortage of people who need help on everything. Um, but it it has been the biggest blessing to have an answer for these people to say flat out the most effective thing for you to do is to post this in the diamond time segment of night yeah. attack this is how you get it out to the maximum number of people this is how you will have an impact because what you're describing because everybody thinks they have an idea like oh all brian has to do is tweet it and i'll have the funding to make this thing happen. And it's like, well, that's not true, but I don't even have the time to explain to you how not true that is. And so instead to have an actually effective place, unbelievably valuable to point them. So here's, here's what I would say to you. If I were to sell Brian on my new, uh, 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 you know, digital, uh, Mary Kondo, uh, uh, philosophy of digital organization, you need to be diligent about pushing that not don't deal with that in your personal email if they know where to go and they're trying to cut the line you need to push them to the line that they deserve to be and you need to work on getting your personal stuff this is just just the stuff that you that is like in inside your personal life and your home life get that down as low as possible because once that is as low as possible, you will find yourself wanting to go and turn on career brain more and you will wind up dealing with that stuff more. Uh, uh, the, you, you will have, uh, I think, the energy to go. At least for me, I have found myself interacting with my other email accounts more once I have I'm looking at zero on the thing that I was I built up so much tension in in having like the fast twitch muscle muscle fiber of like okay i gotta do that and it's like oh okay well now i i'm like okay cool i've settled this part of my life now i can open up this other part of my life and i can now put the emails that i want to in the various uh, uh docs that i need to if i'm doing them for the shows if i'm responding to people then i can then i can do that at least for me that that is that is my that is what i have found uh, has happened over the last year since i separated everything and more so now that I've gotten to inbox zero on my personal stuff. I, I, I get, you know, I get those requests like, Hey, will you retweet this? We put this out there. And I just made me think about what I had to do to get my first mail mailing list when I did my first, wrote my first magic book and Rand Woodbury magician, good friend, great guy gave me an email, a, a physical mail list rather of everybody who had bought his books on magic. I spent, a year working in his workshop, sweeping up the floor and feeding a mountain lion, which at the end of that, I mean, he wasn't like he held that over him. Like, like, why did Rand give it to me? Like, oh, yeah, I used to feed his mountain lion when he was away on the cruise ships. I used to go clean his warehouse. I used to go do all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, no, I don't think I'd put anybody else to that amount of effort, you know, to get a retweet. But it is that kind of thing. Like, that's how, you know, I liked working with Rand. I learned a lot. But that's how much value I put on what he was able to do with me. It was like, yeah, I'll go do this crazy stuff for you. And he gave me an incredible launch. But sometimes we want things too easily. But you know, don't be I, afraid I, to I, ask. I think, yeah, that you people will ask for things. Uh, people will believe that there is... You know, part of it is just grass is always greener, uh, uh, thinking that like, oh, well, this person has all this power. This person has all this uh, uh, ability. This person has all this wealth. Like, all I need to do is ask and my problem will be solved. And, you know, to a certain extent, some of that stuff is is truer than than others. But from the perspective of the person who's getting asked, I think that there is a self-care priority to at least put it in a bin that is people that are asking me for things or you people know, that are. And I, I think people, I, I think that people shouldn't be afraid to ask for sure. things like, you know, there's so many things, opportunities that were, would have been mined for just for having somebody who gone. Yeah. But I mean, like imagine Brian, somebody says, Hey Brian, what can I do to get a retweet from you? Man, that that is more homework than I am comfortable with. You. Like just the mere asking me to yeah. do an assessment of what it takes to get a retweet out of me is already mm -hmm. a bigger ask than than I have time to to deal with. Okay, then what if somebody listened to you say something? You know, like, oh, if I go do blank for you, or if I did this, 
you know. Where, would you? Would you? Uh, where, where, where? What are you getting at? What do you mean? Well, I'm no, saying are, I'm, no, Andrew. You just hit it. Number one, if you want something from Brian, if you want to interact yeah. with Brian, I'm going to go out on a limb and say yeah. that this is the number one way that you can get a positive response, a quicker response out of Brian. If your email or ask, uh, however you're going to do it, could be responded to with, hmm, sounds like work. For Brian, mm -hmm. you it will be time or never get answered. It would like, like for every for every period that would be at the end of the imaginary sentence, sounds like work, dot 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 dot. Oh, dot, I'm, dot, I'm dot, the same way. I have people who want like I want to get an autographed copy of your book, and I'm like, I gotta go find a copy of the book in my warehouse, sign it, it's easy. I then gotta go open up a mail thing i gotta go do this i gotta go like i'm and like and it's minimal it's minimal but for me it's like i don't do that i don't do no. it yeah look, look if it's make it eliminate any way that anybody can answer that email ah, sounds like work and if you don't know what that is make that your 2019 resolution to understand what is work for other people and what is 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 you doing the work yourself oh yeah and you think about like how uh, I didn't post that we're doing, I didn't post that we're doing a live stream on, you know, we're doing this live stream right now. I didn't tweet that out because uh, I was too lazy. Yeah. And even though that that would have, could have brought us a couple dozen more people to watch this, I didn't have a button to press to do this. And because there was no button to press, I didn't do it. Now it's kind of on me to make that button, but I never bothered to make the button because I'm too lazy. I won't even promote my own stuff. Yeah. Oh. It's um, you know, it, it's 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 a fascinating thing to figure out what I mean. Part of it, I think, is just our own psychology, our own self self worth, and where we believe other people are. Right? That they they we tend to think that others have far greater reservoirs of uh, uh effort, wisdom self-confidence than than we do and to rely on somebody else is like oh well surely you can spare whatever you know the the x amount of money to my paypal the y amount of time to go do a thing because like andrew you're you you saying oh can you sign this book it's like man if if i had to go if i ran out of contenders here right and i had to go get a contender from the warehouse that we have or the little storage area that we have down the road it's a, an hour and a half it's an hour and a half out of my day and it's going to be at prime time when when i could be doing other stuff like that's you know by the time you get in get in the car go drive do it go to the post office that's you know uh, that's that's a lot of time yeah so yeah. the answer is uh yes to ask also realize what you're asking <laughs> yeah uh, i mean just yeah. like look how bad do you want it to happen and and that's that's the key like i, I think and this is the 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 link that we all have is we understand that humans are self-interested creatures. Uh, and so we are not saying that self-interest is bad. Your self-interest should be, do you want an interaction? Do you want a favor? Do you want to leg up in your career? Do you want all these things? Congratulations. They are there for you. And I think the three of us uh, have, have enjoyed working with people. I, I think, you know, for, for all that Andrew and Brian, have given to me in my career. I very much enjoy giving to other people, uh, and and I just you just need to do it. Do it in a way that I, any of us will do. When I when I see a name I recognize, you know, somebody who's participated, and say, hey, you know, take a look at my you know, my Kickstarter, or my Patreon, or something like this. I go look, and if I think they yeah. put effort into it, I more often than not will contribute. Sometimes if I can do it anonymously, I'll do that. I'll contribute it. I'm less likely to go retweet it because the failure rate on a lot of these things is so high. But <laughs> That's the one that breaks my heart is everybody thinks it's like, okay, look, I, I'm going to say no, not because I don't want your thing to succeed, but because what you're describing is quite literally the least effective strategy possible to get to what appears to be your real motivation, which is to get this thing funded. Yeah. And I just, that's the thing. When I look at that, I'm like, 
did you do your work? Did you put the effort in? Did you, did you, if, if, and sometimes I've been surprised and, and I, 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 there's a certain threshold. I'm like, yep, I'll help. I'll, I'll contribute to this or whatever. But there are other times you go like, this is a half ass. This is, this is me going out and trying, I want money to write my next book. I'm like, no, I'm going to write it and then sell it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, um, there's, it's, it's cheap to write a book. I don't need somebody to try to fund this, to do that. You know, and I see some of these things where people have done that and, and I've stopped funding some stuff when I'm like, oh, wow, I've been paying every month for this thing and they haven't made a single thing. Uh, and I feel a little, you know, I have like my Patreon, like I have a magic project thing. We made it. We only get paid if we release. We don't release. You know, it doesn't do there, which gets into. Do we want to yeah. talk anti-fragile? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how much more time we got. I'm, I'm expecting a phone call soon, so I may have to bug out. Mm -hmm. but, but I do. I'm a big, big fan of uh, of, of uh, Nassim Taleb's uh, concept of anti fragilism. Do you want to give us your description of it? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, there is uh, in his book Anti Fragile. He says, if I'm remembering correctly, that uh, uh, people take the opposite of fragile is robust. That's not true. Um, uh, fragile is a glass. Uh, robust is a hunk of rubber. You could bounce up hunk of rubber around and it's robust and doesn't lose its shape there's a third category and we need a word for it so he proposes anti-fragile uh your muscles are anti-fragile in that the more you break them down the stronger they get your bones are anti-fragile in that if you don't break them down you uh, they turn to jelly and like they do in the space station and as a result there are systems that are anti-fragile as well that uh become and and back to our opening conversations about social media our ability to uh to handle negative comments is an anti-fragile system it only exists because it's been tested and pushed for so long that that that, that we have gotten stronger as a result of it and if you take that part out of it then you you have what you were describing as the hollywood uh, scenario where you had essentially a, a an immune system that had never dealt with an outside contagion of of uh, criticism and didn't know how to to work with it you yeah. So you think about if you want to certain, you know, businesses, certain careers, certain things like this can be robust or anti-fragile. You know, things that I like is build a thing around a mailing list. More people get on the mailing list, the more powerful the mailing list is. There's an optimum amount of times to use it and it promotes itself. Things, there's some businesses that like, oh, we're going to take out a loan to launch this thing and it's extremely fragile. Could succeed or could not. And, and taking that approach towards going you know, uh, when we launched, I brought that because we launched, you know, the Patreon for the Magic Project. I'm like, well, I want this. If we fail, I don't want it to create bad will. So if we don't create any content, nobody's getting charged. So nobody's going to go like, oh, you owe me money or you did this or you screwed me over. And that's, you know, kind of how to make something that's resilient or somewhat. And so it's, I think it's a thing to think about when you create something is to say, uh, what will what will failure or what will interactions do to this? Will it make it crumble? Will it make it stronger? You know, a oh, lot yeah. of early stage startups better to go out there. We talk about this the book Blitz Scaling. Better to go out there and do everything and fail, so you get that feedback, so your product gets better and better and better. Totally. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that that's. I I think that there is a tremendous disservice that you do yourself when you try to craft the perfect plan in your head yeah uh uh and and then it it just i think boxes you in on on so many levels you would rather well, walk out there and be the the butt of the joke and be uh bad as long as you know so it's like even to everybody that we just talked about that like okay they have a kickstarter they have a patreon and it's half-assed and it looks stupid. Guess what? Your failure isn't necessarily that you did that. Your failure would be if you didn't learn. Yeah. If you didn't look at that and say, wow, that was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. Or, wow, that didn't fund for a reason. Not because I'm this unique, original sin awful, but because the way I went about it was bad. The way that I presented it was bad. Uh, 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 that's, that's the key. It's like, there's no element of failure that isn't a lesson. Now, if you keep burning your hand on the same stove, then yeah, you're stupid. Like stop burning your hand on the same stove. Uh, but if you do it, like never worry about being the 
a hole, the, the, the being being made fun of. Like that's that's a lesson. That's a huge lesson. And sometimes when you fail loudly, it'll teach you more about stuff than if you succeeded accidentally. Yeah. Yeah. All right, picks. Um, man, I I I don't have anything in particular that I'm all fired up about at the moment. Uh, it's been a nice, quiet uh, few weeks. Uh, I've been reading a column that ran from 1935 to 1962. Do you did you know that Eleanor Roosevelt had a six day a week syndicated newspaper column from basically the election season? Her FDR's first election season, his first re-election, right up through the 1960 election, six days a week, and it was called My Day, and it was initially just kind of like uh, the uh, appearing into the life of uh, of of the uh, of, of the first lady after Ike got elected. It became more political, and it eventually wound up getting dropped by Scripps Syndicate because it was too political, and it factors into the 1960 election, which is why I know it. But I've been reading Eleanor Roosevelt's columns. Holy cow! Like, 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 are they particularly good, or is it just strange and wonderful and weird to look into that period of history? Uh, she was a very savvy political person, and and by the, at, at the point where she starts sharpening up her elbows and starts trying to be a kingmaker. Uh, as the the living legacy of a, at that point the greatest political dynasty i mean we will probably all live our lives not knowing a greater longer american political dynasty than the roosevelt administration she was really smart and she hated the kennedys <laughs> you, you know what and it's interesting too is it like Whenever I hear about a politician who writes a lot, I'm like, ghostwriter, 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 yeah. ghostwriter. Like, like you probably can't name most people, I would say, can't name a book by a current politician that they actually wrote. Oh, yeah. um, uh, by all accounts, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote her own stuff. Oh, she wrote it. it, it they, they were not necessarily voluminous, but again, six yeah. days a week. That's yeah. like that's like Dear Abby stuff like that. I mean, that that's an insane schedule. Yep. At, at, yeah. At, at the height, she reached four million people six days a week. Wow. Wow. An amazing. Amazing legacy. Um, but. Huh. How about that Twitter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Bryce, anything? Uh, I, I don't think I have a, a, a pick for after things this week. It's it's been kind of just a lot of a lot of old stuff for me. I have I have a pick. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Bryce. I, I didn't know that I set things so current with the Eleanor Roosevelt <laughs> columns from 1947. Um, Look what I got. Oh, what do you got? Uh, in the back of your shoulder. In my head. No, it's a, and see if you can recognize the sound. Sounds oh, like man. what? What an amazing uh, uh, reveal this is going to be as soon as the camera <laughs> recognize the sound. Anybody? Anybody? You know, make the sound again. It's a Rubik's cube. It's a Close, it's a Brian. Commodore sixty four. I'm going to knock on it now. It's uh, a door. Something inside of it. It's a Kinder egg. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, Jack in the Box. Maybe. Is it a? Is it a? Oh, we've lost, okay. Is it a pop up book? Is it a new pop up book? No, better, better. Better than a pop up. He better. likes pop up books too. Uh, oh! <laughs> this is an amazing reveal. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Houdini cell. From yeah, Stamps dude. Uh, dude, have, have, have you have uh, you have you solved it yet? No. I, what? It does something? Uh, yes, it does. Inside, you'll find a collection of wonderful, beautiful what? goodies. All you need to do is unlock the secrets of Houdini's cell. Uh, specifically, it's interesting. I get a lot of people tweeting me who have opened it, and people are brute forcing it. They're opening it first, then they're bothering to go solve the codes and find out uh, what the answer was and why it made sense. It's like they wanted to lock in the ability to know the 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 solution before they found out the story that led them there. Uh, so it'll, I'll be really interested to hear your experience on there. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see if I have the patience. But 
<laughs> I'm uh, a I'll very tell you what, impatient if, man. If, if, if you want a sub twenty minute experience, um, don't don't pretend like there's any joy in solving the ciphers on your own. Just go to a, a solver, uh, a cipher solver, because even then. There's mm -hmm. there's hints and stories that'll lead you in the right direction. I would say it's probably a 15 or 20 minute experience for you to to actually quote unquote, you know, there's a difference between opening the box and solving the box. And I I think yeah, you, you no, I agree. I'm 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 you know I'm looking at this here and there's some clues and stuff. He's and already he's already solving it live on the air. <laughs> and uh -huh. hammer. I just realized there's Houdini on the back with a wolf over his shoulder. <laughs> So, um, I'm looking forward to it. Very cool. uh, oh, I'm so excited. Uh, uh, when you get a moment, let me know how, how the experience landed yeah. for you. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, and I think we could do a next week, maybe do an, I want to do a discussion, maybe an after things about the, the future of experienced designers. Cool. Mm. Yeah. So, that'll be, that'll be the, the architect and game designer of the future. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. It's been after. Mm. Do, 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 do. Alrighty, hey, good shows, everybody. Yeah. Cheers. Good. I see <laughs> this it. is a great freeze frame right there. Oh no. <laughs> I don't know what the hot ham water is going on with that yeah, camera, man. You're... Like that is that is crazy pants. Oh, I think it's my connection. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you very much, Hando Tadpool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you everybody for for uh watching the show. Sorry, I just found out I was editing my show notes in my template and not in Oh. Oh, oh no! Oh, somebody had asked about my interactive writing thing. I, I, right now, it's sitting on a server and something I played with. I have no idea what I'm going to do with that. You know, it was I go through these sort of manic creative modes, which are great for writing novels, not so good for writing software. So, yeah. I mean, I, I make things and then I go, eh, all right, now what? All right, we'll be back uh, in a few hours. The Court Killers, Justin, do you have a uh, jury later today? Jury at three. Jury at three. Andrew, got anything coming out this week? Uh, writing the book, writing another Theo Cray book, and Theo Cray number three comes out in just a few weeks. That's right, Murder awesome. Theory. Pre-order it today. Yeah, I'm excited and terrified. Oh, uh, Wednesday, uh, probably in the morning, uh, Andrew was on my new podcast. Oh, right on. And uh, so that'll, oh, be, yeah. that'll be coming out this week. So uh, everybody check it out, trendinglemon.com. Cool. Do you have a release schedule on that? Uh, yeah, it'll be Wednesday morning. Cool. So uh, we, we got it. We got a good little little catalog of episodes there. So. Nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, but until then, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>